Hi, uh, welcome to this creative access workshop uh, run by me. Uh, my name is Joe, and I am artistic director of Chronic Insanity. Uh, I'm a white person with kind of medium length brown hair, uh, blue framed glasses and a sort of brown gingery beard. Uh, I'm wearing a gray t-shirt behind a bright blue hoodie. And behind me, you can see uh, a white wall and ceiling with a kind of bare wooden door, a light wood over my left shoulder, and a Christmas tree covered in colorful baubles with a shark on top of it over my right shoulder. Um, what I just did then is an audio description. I described the visual scene for anybody who may not be able to see the scene, but still wants to understand what is in front of them, that intentional visual information within that piece. And uh, that is one of the three main cornerstones of access that we talk about a lot when we're trying to provide creative access for, um, or access in general, to be perfectly fair, for live events. The ABCs are audio description, uh, BSL, or British Sign Language, and captioning. Um, audio description is, like I just said, um, describing the visual scene, what is happening visually for somebody who may not be able to see that uh, at all or easily. Um, translating the uh, what can be perceived by the eyes so that it can be perceived by the ears. Uh, BSL, or British Sign Language, is um, a language that is spoken uh, primarily by uh, deaf people. Uh, it is uh, an official language of the United Kingdom, and technically, government and public events should all be sign language interpreted, I think, as an official language of the UK. Um, so if you are an artist whose creative practice is generally funded in a large part by local council funding or by the Arts Council, which again is funded by the government, then that might be something to consider uh, moving forwards. So you're kind of... Uh, how much of that responsibility you are actually supposed to be doing. But essentially that is so that people who are deaf can still understand um, the audio in a show, whether that be speech, whether that be sound effects, whether that be music. Um, and then we have captioning, which is um, a way of the audio in a show to be written out in text. Um, and that, again, could be speech primarily, but also sound effects and music, lyrics and songs, that sort of thing. Um, it can be for people who um, may have become deaf later in life. Um, it can be for people who are born deaf, but that's less likely. Uh, people who are born deaf and learn British Sign Language as a first language. Um, captions written in spoken English are a second language and providing captions for people who are native signers uh, is not particularly accessible. Um, captions for people who are deaf are much more useful for people who were born learning spoken English and then became deaf later in life. They're also useful for lots of people who might be uh, neuro neurodivergent. Um, and then captions are generally just useful for all sorts of people. Um, people like younger audiences who tend to watch TV and things on their phones with captions, more often than not, the younger you go down the generations, um, as well as if for any recording purposes. Um, if your show is going to be live streamed or recorded and then presented on demand, you might as well have captions ready for that, um, for people to, you know, read if they can't hear, if they can't listen to the show, but they still want to experience it. Maybe they don't have headphones. Maybe they can't play their audio out loud wherever they're watching it. This is the sort of general theme of access in general, is that we don't necessarily know why someone needs the access, and it's not really important why they need it. It's just the fact that they need it, and so we should provide it. And then creative access is building that access into the show as like a fundamental element of the production or the dramaturgy or the design of the show so that it feels whole and purposeful. Um, there are several reasons why we do this. One of those is because there is a tendency for productions to hit a certain crunch point, whether that be time, whether that be money, whether that be some other resource. And 
if access is added late into the production process, it can often be the first thing cut, one of the things taken out, last in, first out. And that means that because of other issues through time management or logistics throughout the process, you end up making your show less accessible. And the whole reason we put on shows is to tell stories to people and access is there because there are people who can't understand the show in the way that we would tell it without that access. So we should include the access so that more people can hear the story that we're telling, can be entertained, enlightened, socially bonded to the characters or the audience around them. That's why we do it. Fundamentally, if we make theatre or any live performance, but theatre especially, what we're wanting to do is tell stories to people and access means that we do that more effectively. Um, and really it's more like without access, we're not doing it effectively. It should be there, really. We all should do better. And we can do. And also there's no perfect way of doing it. You do just need to do a bit better and then a bit better. There's no correct like bar or line to cross. There's no bar to reach, but it's just doing more. Having one piece of access, having all the access in one performance, in uh, a whole production, every single performance of that production. With creative access, you can do that more effectively because it's built into the show. It's not just one performance that has some sign language interpretation to the side of it at a Wednesday matinee when no one's going to come see the show anyway. Like, it's offensive to not include it and to include it in the quiet days when it's not going to be in the way of your regular audience, I say with air quotes, um, is offensive. It doesn't make people feel considered. People feel like your audience feels like an afterthought. Whereas if you build the creative access into the work, they feel considered throughout the whole process. Um, they feel like you've telling the story for them, like the work is for them and they will be more likely to be able to relax into it and be entertained by it. They'll be more likely to uh, commit to it, to stick with it, to understand it, to learn from it, to be socially bonded with the rest of the people around them, to feel like part of society because you've made your work accessible. We'll get on to society and disability in a little while. Um, the other reason to build access directly into the show is because sometimes access can clash with other disabled, deaf or neurodivergent people. Um, I think the, the most obvious example that I've come across in my work is providing captions so that people who might be deaf or neurodivergent with um, sensory processing issues can read the captions. That's great, but those captions can also distract people who have other neurodivergences. Um, I heard from a, um, a technician in the theatre who has ADHD that, um, ADHD, well, that could happen, but um, I've heard from other people who uh, identify on the autism spectrum that captions can be distracting. They feel like they have to watch the captions or they get distracted by them changing and they can't focus on the action that's happening on stage. But that's only an issue when those captions aren't incorporated into the action on stage. And if you have creative captioning, say, projected onto the back of the set in a dedicated area of that set for those captions, where the captions are animated, they can be they have different colors and different fonts for different characters, they can follow characters around the stage, um, they can be on a TV screen in the front of the set. Um, I produced a show that was a vault festival in 2020, uh, just before the, the COVID lockdowns in the UK called Glitch. And that show had creative captioning, which looked like a kind of you know, pixel art uh, video game. But when different characters in the show were talking, and it was a one-woman show, like we had one person performing the whole thing, the characters uh, would come up as a little kind of video game pixel art avatars with a text box saying their lines in it. Uh, the settings would also change behind the characters depending on the different scenes in the show. We used the fact that we had quite a minimal staging to the advantage of the captions. And so the captions were there to inform the set and the setting of each show to give you an idea of who the other characters being voiced by the performer on stage were. And that meant that now everyone had a reason to be engaging with those captions. 
they weren't a distraction because they were intentioned for the whole audience, regardless of that audience's ability. They just happened to have an access feature amongst the many other qualities of those captions. And that was a very successful creative captioning. Um, an example of audio description. Um, there is a playwright in the East Midlands called Emily Holyoke, and she wrote a play with Derby Theatre called Snake Oil. And Snake Oil is an audio drama. Um, and if you want to have a think about how to do audio description, the easiest way to do it is consider your play as a radio play. What actions that are happening physically in the stage directions or by your performers in the physical space that would only be seen visually, do you need to have spoken in some way so that an audience listening in but not watching will be able to hear? Because that's essentially what you have if you are audio describing a show to people. Does this need to be spoken or can it be through sound effects and foley art? A chair being moved, a flump sound, and then that chair being moved in with a bit more heft in it implies someone has sat down quite effectively. A doorbell, a door opening and closing, and the speed at which that happens, there's lots of information that can take place within the sound effects of a show, which counts as audio description. It describes the space through foley art and through sound effects rather than through speech you shouldn't maybe solely rely on that depends on the production and mainly you're probably going to have an audio describer watching the show and saying what's happening having maybe rehearsed having watched um a rehearsal or a recording of a performance so that they know what to anticipate uh so they, they can anticipate they know what to describe and when it needs describing they know when the pace of the show is going to speed up or slow down and can be ready to if they need to change the speed at which they're describing things um but uh, Snake Oil by Emily Holyoke built audio description in really effectively. And that was by uh, having one of the characters be a journalist and the other character being interviewed by that journalist. And the whole show is recorded on the journalist's dictaphone. And that journalist is taking notes as well as having the interview conversation. And those notes include what the setting that the interview is in, what they are wearing, what their person they are interviewing is wearing. Um, the other character then mocks their diligent note taking and will add in a way that it is effective audio description and doesn't mock the audio description itself, but mocks the um, the uh, nerdiness and the precision with which the journalist does their job. And in a way, it's still effective audio description. And that was written between uh, Emily Holyoke and the director of that, I was, I believe, Louisa Hamphy. And they worked really hard to try and build that audio description into that show perfectly. And I think they did a really good job with it. Uh, we've talked about captioning, we've talked about audio description. Let's talk about BSL, sign language interpretation. Now, audio description is, well, if you have the budget to pay for a professional, either to consult you on making your own audio description or to build it into the show, you should do. Um, but you can, on a budget, on a tight budget, do your own audio description. Like I said, it's what's happening visually in the space that isn't being sound affected or spoken about and described by a performer. How can you make sure that, that is represented in an audio way and not just in a visual way? It's not rocket science. And there are different nuances. It's why there's a craft and there are professionals at it. But if you are on a tight budget, you can do it yourself. Likewise, captioning can be fancy animated lyric video-esque captions, or it can be slides in a PowerPoint that get hit with a space bar by your operator alongside all of the lighting and sound cues. Um, they don't have to be fancy. You can do them on a projector. You can buy a TV off Gumtree, use it for the show, and then put it on Facebook Marketplace and sell it at the end, meaning you haven't actually spent any money. We did that for that show at Vault Festival that I was just talking about for Glitch. Um, we didn't have to pay anything for those captions other than to pay the uh, video uh, artist, the video designer who made them for us. But we could have just used a PowerPoint technically. Sign language interpretation, you need a qualified, trained professional. They need to be qualified. They need to be able to be uh, good at it. It is, it is not just a skill in the way that maybe being a video designer or an audio describer is. It's speaking a language, and you need someone who can speak that language fluently and appropriately in order to sign your show. There's not only sign language interpretation, there are also other forms. Um, there's visual vernacular, which is more of a kind of like a poetic, interpretive 
form of signing and that might be more appropriate for a show if you're going with a show that has more of a dance or physical theatre element or a show that maybe is more poetic and metaphorical and you want someone to kind of evoke that same feeling in their sign but most people will be using a bog standard sign language interpreter um there are registers and organizations who will be able to find someone in your area for you or where you will be able to look on the register and find somebody yourself um if you ask an interpreter if they're free and they're not free you can ask them for a recommendation of someone who might be free and they will very happily recommend you other people because the more shows that are getting interpreted you know the better um and then if you want to build that sign language interpretation into your show then you have to budget for that um you need a place for the interpreter to stand within your staging within your uh plotting of the show you need them to be lit appropriately you need them to be able to be standing frontwards on to the audience so that they're not signing sideways which is much less effective if you're filming the show you need to make sure that the camera is filming them from a front ways front facing position like if you see a sign language interpreter on tv they're always facing forwards because that is the way that sign language is designed to be seen to be most easily read um interpreted understood um so sign language is more expensive to implement but is also more um you know like i said before it's an official language of the united kingdom depending on what level and where your funding's from you might actually arguably have a necessity to include this um was captioning and audio descriptions you just should from a, you know, a moral perspective an ethical perspective and because they were useful for lots of people from uh, who might identify as disabled, who might not identify as disabled. They can be built more easily into shows. And if you are a small company with small budgets starting out, there is nothing stopping you from putting captions and audio description into the work. Edit your script. To get a set designer who's used to designing for them. Or get someone who cares about it, who wants to try for the first time. You don't need an expert. You just need to be willing and... You need to not be so rigid in the way that you're making the rest of the work that you can't include these elements fundamentally. But I guess that might just be being willing. And if you actually care about access, you will find a way to include captioning audio description easily. And then if you are a larger organization, a venue, someone with significant funding, or if you've, you're putting a funding bid in, you should look to get money to pay for a sign language interpreter. Um, Sessions for we work with a sign language interpreter recently for Lifetimes, another show in Puncture the Screen, the festival this workshop's a part of. And we paid them um, £600 for the interpretation of an event and the rights to then show that interpretation online for uh, a month afterwards. Um, sometimes sign language interpreters might want to reinterpret an event if they feel like they weren't prepared enough on the day and they didn't deliver an interpretation that they think is functional that they're proud of they might ask to reinterpret something um, if you don't give them enough time or materials to prepare on the day they might turn up and refuse to interpret the event because they don't think they can do a good enough job that's completely fair and it is down to you as the production to make sure that people uh, are communicated with effectively are given scripts or recordings of runs from rehearsals to look at beforehand if they are turning up on the day that there is maybe a run through or a read through or something that they can be a part of so that they can practice and understand. If it's a, a lecture or a discussion, a panel event, that they are given any particular jargon or genre specific words that might not be in a regular vocabulary for them to sometimes remember how to sign, sometimes learn or figure out how they're going to sign. Um, Lifetimes is a show that talks about something called um, there's there's like there's a piece of sci-fi technology in there which doesn't exist, and so we worked with the sign language interpreter before the show happened to figure out what the sign for that lifetimer would be because lifetime is not a word that exists in English and not a word that exists in sign language before our show, so we had to try and figure out how to sign it in a way that made sense, communicated what we wanted to communicate effectively. And that's fine. We did that all, you know, great. The 
Signing is tiring, it's exhausting, it's stressful. If you don't have that agreement with somebody, normally you're going to want more than one sign language interpreter for an event for them to swap out every 15, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, different people have different amounts that they want to switch, but the standard is usually for an event, particularly if it's like a discussion, a Zoom, an online thing. If it's something that people haven't rehearsed for, practiced, haven't agreed to do by themselves, then the normal way of working with sign language interpreters is going to be hire two people to swap in and out when one person wants a break uh, so that there is always effective signing, but no one is being so tired that they might uh, make a mistake and stop being as effective as a signer because sign language translating and then performing that translation physically is a tiring job um, and you want to do a good job um, so you don't damage your, damage your reputation or you know just not communicate something effectively um, and be as the show, the production, the artist, you need to make sure that the people working for you to translate your show can do the best job they can. Um, but the best way to learn how to do that is to ask the interpreters what they need from you beforehand. Scripts, footage of rehearsals, full runs of the show, marketing material, list of particular jargon or words that aren't regular vocabulary in everyday speech, the ability to sit in on things. If you want to build that sign language into your show, then what access does that interpreter need? Do they need any access requirements of their own? Um, ask them for an access rider, which we'll get onto in a moment. Um, how many rehearsals do they need to be a part of in order to rehearse by themselves? And then you take all that information and you try to make it work with the resources that you have for that production. Um, maybe you only want access for a single performance, but the whole point of this workshop is creative access, is building that access into the heart of the show so that it can't be taken away if ticket sales are low and you're not going to maybe get as much money as possible. You don't have to ever advertise that a show is accessible and then rip that access away from somebody. Um, advertising shows accessible is all about the informed consent of the audience. It's all about the audience's ability to be able to say, I'm going to be able to actually understand this, to know what's happening and therefore to enjoy it or to be moved by it or to be entertained or to learn from but if you say that a show is captioned or sign language interpreted and then someone turns up and it's not then you are the reason why that person can't see the show um it's not a lack of funding it's not um an, an issue last minute it's because you decided to remove the access that was in that production and that's offensive <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. That's a that's a bad decision, and you shouldn't make that decision. You should make another decision. Um, and it's harder for you to make that decision if that access is a more core element of the production. Whether you're making that decision because you think it's the simplest or whether you're making that decision with a heavy heart and really begrudgingly, don't let yourself be in a position where you can make that decision. Creative access means that the show can never have its access taken away from it because it is a part of the show in the same way that the script and the direction and the design and the performances are. Um, those are the main three, the ABCs. There are other things you can do as well. Uh, relaxed performances are the big one. Um, there's no agreed upon definition of what a relaxed performance is, but Jess Tom um, from Tourette's Hero wrote a great blog post recently. Um, this was originally recorded on the 5th of December, 2023. And only a few weeks ago, that blog post came out, I think, highlighting seven qualities that a relaxed performance should have as somebody who creates relaxed performances and also benefits from them as an audience member. Um, that uh, Seek out that blog post on the Tourette's Hero website. That could go into much more detail in a much more informed and clear way than I can in this workshop. But find that, read that, and then decide if you want to implement all of that into your shows. It's not impossible. It's work, but it's doable. And given the amount of people that relaxed performances help, whether those are people with dementia, whether those are people with uh, neurodivergences, whether those are people that just want to be able to like go to the toilet in the middle of a play and not feel like they're going to miss things. Like they're just, whether they're people who you know, feel more comfortable bringing their kids to a show, 
relaxed performances are sort of what traditional theatre was always like until the upper classes decided to try to make theatre a silent event and kick all of the working class people out of it. Um, it used to be a place where you could make noise, you could join in, uh, or if other people did, you didn't mind because, hey, you're surrounded by human beings and it's society and you're all there to watch a thing. Whereas performances should definitely be more commonplace. And they only do that if you start implementing more of them into the way that you work. But it's not just about attitude, it's also about technology and sensory. It's about keeping the house lights on. It's about not having sudden increases in lighting or sound, uh, jump scares, either making everything quieter throughout the show or signposting when the large elements of tech, when the big lights and big sound happen, ramping up to them slowly in a way that people can be anticipatory of, in a way that people know where if they need to put on their dark glasses or their ear defenders, and they haven't already, to do so, indicating to people that that's a good thing. Something that can help with that is something called a sound journey. Uh, you can make a graphic that shows the general volume throughout the show and at which points things get louder or quieter for people that need that information. It's almost like um, a kind of a content warning for volume or intensity of the sensory elements of the show. And that's becoming more and more popular. It's fairly easy to knock up if you have your sound design locked in. Can really, if I'm being honest, can be done in five minutes. Um, and there isn't an accepted format to doing it imperfectly, so you can't do it wrong if what you're doing is doing it clearly. You can also just have things on hand. Uh, a member of staff, for someone to say, hey, I have a question about the sensory content of the show. How do I know this is coming up? At what point is this happening? Stuff like that. Um, not impossible to do. Something you should be having at relaxed performances are informed front of house staff who can answer questions in, in an informed way that makes people feel comfortable like they have been considered like this production is for them this show or this exhibition or whatever it is has been made with them in mind and they are intended not yeah encouraged as an audience for it. um content warnings have content warnings if your show relies on a twist that involves something that would be an ordinary content warning in my opinion not a very good show Times change. It's 2023. If if the big twist in your show is something traumatic um, and you don't want to spoil it for people, then you could write, do a different show, write it differently. Don't work with that writer or that script or change it. If it's an established show, ah, change it, do it differently or have a content warning. If it's established, people who are seeing it might already know the twist. If people are worried about seeing a content warning that they weren't anticipating on seeing if they don't feel like they need any content warned and they feel like they can't avoid it um that's a self-control thing on their part but let's presume it's an access thing let's presume that they can't avoid it content warnings can be made very visible up on pieces of paper around the venue they can be made visible on websites but they can be hidden behind a single layer you can write them in the same text as the background of your website so if people want to read them they have to highlight that text you can have them in a drop down menu or on another web page that people can click through to see. And then maybe why stop there? Click through to find out more information. Oh, this show contains um, gunshots. How many? When do they happen? So I can anticipate I don't have to see a gun in the first act and then worry for the whole show there's going to be a gunshot if indeed I need to be preparing myself for that. Does one at the beginning of the show and two at the end, five seconds after the blackout? There we go. Nice, simple. If someone needs to remember that, they will do and have that through one or two clicks away on a web page, just linked into a Google Doc uh, linked somewhere. People will be able to find that information if they need it and won't be able to stumble across it by accident if doing so will feel like spoiling something for them. Although if it becomes a big plot thing you want to try and hide, maybe your show shouldn't have a content warning as a plot twist. Um, maybe that's not necessary. I'm saying a lot of maybes because there will be a thing that will prove that wrong as well as things that prove it right. Um, that's a maybe. But by the by, regardless of whether you agree with me on that, content warnings provide them, people need them, and more and more people 
are going to need them more and more often. So yeah. Um, there are other sensory elements you can include. Um, often, if you know that you have visually impaired audiences in, you might have a touch tour where just before the show begins, like say half an hour before the show, um, or blind audiences can talk to the cast. They can feel maybe some of the props, the costumes, uh, walk around the set on stage and get a feel for the show quite literally. So that when they're then sitting on stage, they can more easily picture how they want to picture what is happening on stage. Um, touch tours are growing in popularity and are a really great way to not only uh, make your shows more accessible, but to make audiences that need touch tours feel more uh, considered, feel more special, actually. You know, they are getting a little sneaky meet and greet with the cast and to get on stage, like, it's cool. Uh, that's a fun thing. And there's nothing wrong with giving that to people who have other elements of the show taken away from them. Um, because if you're doing relaxed performances, you can also announce those as relaxed performances. Um you can have a character come out and explain what a relaxed performance is to the audience. You can say, we are performers, but I'm not actually in danger. Um, if there is danger or peril in the show, um, those are really good things to be able to do. Relaxed performances for people are uh, different reasons for different people. And a little explanation of that tells the whole audience why what is happening is happening, informs them, and then also lets people who need that re extra reassurance that what they're seeing in a play is not real. We are performing and we're good friends, really. And at the end of this should play, we're all going to bow together and you'll see that that's all fine. Good thing to do. Um, we talk about sensory stuff, have quiet spaces, have dedicated quiet areas with fidget toys and uh, muted low lighting and soft, comfortable places to sit um, for people who need to just take get away from it for a bit and hey if it's a rats performance people should be able to leave and come back whenever they want without feeling worried about that if people want to come back in they will do but they can't if you ban people from coming back into the show if your show needs say like a blackout for a particular moment you can have a front of house member tell people to like wait a bit before they come back in that's fine controlling the in and out for key moments in the show is perfectly reasonable rather than having it as a free open door that people can move through at any point if there are moments that require that stillness but to blanket it by saying no one can leave or people leave they can't come back in not accessible not acceptable um and again for something very easy to build into the show and if the venue has a policy then don't go to that venue or don't go to that venue again or make them change it um Fight them on it. Be a being an ally isn't a passive thing, you know. Sometimes you got to fight people on it. More often than not, venues do want to be more accessible. Um, the staff almost always want to be more accessible. And the number of times I've worked with venues when they hear that we're going above and beyond and not just doing the bare minimum, they are ecstatic. They really like that, you know. And then they'll help support you a bit more as well if if you're the show that's gonna let them have an accessible thing then that's great they might be more helpful if you have other questions or other queries or are going to kind of push the boat out a little bit more in other ways um so yeah that's all the sorts of stuff you can include in in your show audio description and captioning very easy sign language interpretation it requires money but if you have that funding is easy and then relaxed performances uh quiet spaces uh sound journeys and touch tours um and make it creative make it built into the show your quiet space can be themed like the show is without not functioning as a quiet space anymore uh the sound journey can be linked to the marketing the content warnings could be delivered in a way that is thematically relevant to the show like you don't have to make access boring, dull, functional. It needs to function, but it can also be creative and interesting and designed well. And creative access ensures that, as well as many other things I've just been talking about. Um, yeah. Let's talk about society. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about access riders first. Um Access riders are documents. Um, you can find them by Googling how to write an access rider. Um, 
I wrote a blog post for uh, Dada, the disability and deaf arts organization based in Liverpool, about how to write an access rider and how I wrote mine. But there are templates on the Unlimited website, another disability arts organization in the UK, um, that will help you write an access rider. Mine is a document that says who I am, um, what my disabilities or neurodivergences are, what I understand about them, and what people can do in order to make the workplace more accessible for me. Um, it can be anything that you need or want. And then at the end, I have a few extra links, a few links to some charities that prove that my disabilities are real disabilities. Like here are other people vouching for them, which maybe I shouldn't need to include, but I worry about, so I put those in there anyway, as well as a link to um, a definition of spoon theory, the idea that you need to explain about um, energy and fatigue to people that uh, you might wake up one day with a certain number of spoons and each task takes spoons from you. And then when you are out of spoons, you're out of energy for the day and will now struggle, if not find things that other people might anticipate to be everyday ordinary tasks impossible to achieve. And so you have to take things slowly and smoothly and that you might have a different number of spoons each day as well. Some days you might have loads of spoons, other days fewer, or maybe not loads of spoons, but some spoons and then less spoons than that the next day. Um, I also have a link to describe what the social model of disability. Um, the social model of disability is the understanding that um, people aren't inherently disabled, as in they do not have a quality of themselves that is a disability they are made to be disabled by the world around them. Um, the medical model of disability, which is the kind of older way of looking at disability, was the idea that people who are disabled have a quality in them that is not functioning, it is abnormal, and that medicine can try and cure that quality and overcome that problem. Well, there's a social model, which is a kind of... Uh, one step further, a more modern and informed way of thinking shows that people who are disabled or deaf or neurodivergent don't have an, a medical issue necessarily, but are disabled by society. If someone is in a wheelchair and every building has ramps, then they're not disabled when they want to go somewhere. But if buildings have steps, then they are disabled. It's not their wheelchair or the reason why they might need that wheelchair permanently or temporarily that disables them. It's access to a building. Um, and a good example of this when not being an issue is um, when we include access for people with colorblindness. Um, the green in a traffic light has a bit of blue in it. So if you have red green colorblindness, which is quite common, um, you don't mistake a red traffic light for a green traffic light because you'll see them as red and some sort of blue. Likewise, the wires inside a plug, back when every appliance needed to have a plug wired into it when you bought it, people needed to wire plugs frequently. So the three wires of back of plug were they? Blue, green, yellow stripes, and brown. I think are designed in a way that means that they are easier to distinguish for someone with color blindness. Now, color blindness is a predominantly male condition, and women don't tend to get color blindness outside of a genetic mutation whereas about 10% of the male population have colorblindness. And um, it's just one other part of the patriarchy that shows us that disability doesn't have to be um, an innate quality. People who are colorblind aren't disabled from driving. They're not disabled from wiring a plug, buying appliances by themselves and making those appliances functional or changing a plug or, you know, nowadays. Um, Men can be electricians and men can drive because society has, has adapted those things so that people with color blindness, i.e. 10% of the male population, can do them without there being a problem. Society has changed the way things work so that people with a quality, which is a neutral quality, can behave in society in the same way as everybody else. And it could do that with more things. And that's why we add creative access into our work, because otherwise we are disabling people. Those people aren't disabled. We are disabling them if we don't make our work accessible, because we could do, like I've said for the past half hour.
that is a social model. And an access rider allows us to make sure that we do not disable those that are working with us. Um, now, technically speaking, there are lots of things that could disable us uh, in other ways. And why stop there? Finances, geography, um, technological literacy and understanding how online systems work. Um, things like teleconferencing, online, any sort of software or websites or social media. Um, you don't have to be disabled to make an access rider. Actually, if you are in charge of an organizational company, you should make all of your stuff. Create one. People will have childcare responsibilities. People will have to travel different distances from work. People will have other caring responsibilities outside of childcare. They will have ways they prefer to work for her to be contacted. And an access rider is a really good way to get everybody that you work with uh on the same page about how everyone else wants to work does everyone prefer emails do people want in a freelance project to keep communications in standard working hours or are people happy to be communicated uh late at night or on the weekends access riders benefit everybody and everyone and anyone can write one you don't have to identify as disabled deaf or neurodivergent and in fact i know a few people who have actually understood things about themselves and realize that they were disabled or realize that they are neurodivergent because of the process of creating an access rider and realizing, oh, there's a lot of stuff here that actually I do quite need. And that has started them on a journey of understanding and self-discovery, which they are really happy they've gone down as a result of starting to write access riders. So they might benefit you in multiple ways. At the very least, they help everyone get on the same page. It also, if everyone writes an access rider, you're not othering disabled people. You're not making them do a thing or asking a special thing from them but not from other people and technically othering someone or asking someone to do something that someone else isn't is almost a definition of discrimination so everyone doing an access rider is a benefit to everybody and it stops you othering people who are disabled deaf or neurodivergent so perfect <laughs> why not do it um that's the sort of main takeaway from this workshop is the social model of disability and the idea that people are disabled by society and not just disabled people. If a show is on one location, people who live too far away can't watch it. They are disabled by that decision. Um, if a ticket price for a show is too expensive and people can't afford it, they are, they are, it's not accessible. If a show is online but is really convoluted you know if it's being live streamed or recorded to be put online after the fact but you have to go through a ticketing website and then buy a ticket even though it's a free show and then get sent a link and then they have to try and open that or they have to put a password in you're, it might be too complicated for some audiences and you're not making that work accessible you are disabling people by the way that you are creating and presenting your work and we didn't even touch on live streams earlier but yeah um that's an access thing. People might be vulnerable or shielding or unable to travel because uh, the transport network, public transport disables them or because they can't drive or for whatever reason. So making recordings for on-demand distribution or live streaming your work is a very effective access tool. And like I said, can also be creatively built into productions. Um, in many, many ways. You can have a character to live stream the show. You can have people even just looking at the camera when they're talking to the audience helps the at-home audience feel like they are part of the audience, regardless of where they are physically located, regardless of their geography or their place in time if they're watching a pre-recorded thing. Um, a live audience can still exist outside of a particular space and a particular time. It's within the moment of the show being on, in my opinion. And me watching a show three years after it's been put on in a theatre halfway around the world, I can still feel part of that audience recorded within that show at a completely different time, at a completely different space. Um, maybe that's just a, a younger perspective. Um, people who have grown up very much embedded within the, the internet, knowing that people who aren't physically present with you or who aren't physically present with you, either geography or in time, space or time, can still have impacts beneficial and detrimental um they can still affect you they are still within your temporal or physical periphery and you can affect them they can affect you there is effective communication backwards and forwards 
I don't know what else liveness is. So yeah, uh, to summarize the second half, everyone should write an access rider, regardless of whether you're disabled or not. Um, people are disabled in many different ways. Um, some we call disabilities or neurodivergence or deafness, but others could be other qualities of someone's life that they are not in control of. And by making your work more accessible for disabled people, you make your work more accessible for everybody. Um, also, if you are fortunate enough to not identify as disabled, that might change. Um, there is a quite extreme saying within disability art circles that there are two types of people, those who are disabled and those who aren't disabled yet. And as we get older, we are more likely as we age to get more and more disabled um, or to go from not being disabled to being disabled. But again, that's being disabled by society that doesn't cater for the ways in which our bodies naturally change as we grow older. Um, making your work more accessible is uh, to an extent like a moral right. It's a necessity. And there are lots of different ways to do it for your staff and your creative collaborators by having access riders, by communicating with people effectively in the ways in which they want to communicate by trying to figure out clashes in access and by allowing people to work remotely when you know necessary when it works with the project considering those when the project is being done and changing the way the project is being made or the work is being made in order to make it more accessible both for your staff and for your audiences um, if you want to look up spoon theory in more detail, I don't think I gave a particularly good description of it. Please do. It's a very quick read and very easy to understand when I'm not describing it. Likewise, look up the social model of disability more. Look up access riders on either the Dada Fest website or the Unlimited website and understand the social model of disability that people are not disabled. There's an inherent quality in themselves, but that society disables them and has the whole or majority reason why they might identify that way and that all of us have a duty to try and stop actively disabling people because ableism is not an active thing you decide to do it is the lack of trying to stop it ableism is a passive quality that is just the way that the world is when no one is acting upon it and if we want to make a world less ableist we have to actively do that in all of the ways that we behave in the world and if we make work make our want to tell stories or exhibit work to people then we need to actively challenge and strategize around and overcome ableism our work will not automatically be uh disability friendly or accessible we have to think about it we have to put that in place and the sooner in the creative process or the producing or logistical process we consider that the more effective that will be for both disabled audiences and non-disabled audiences. Um, feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. Pop things in the comments for the next couple of weeks. I'll be checking the comments and we'll be able to respond to them if you have any particular questions. And please have a look at the rest of the festival. Um, a lot of the work in the festival is uh, accessible with captions or audio description or BSL interpretation um, or with very nuanced detailed content warnings which you can find on punctofthestream.com for every piece in the festival every work film experience um head to punctofthestream.com see the rest of the work that's on and learn a little bit more about making that sort of work in an accessible way um and yeah i hope you enjoy this workshop and the rest of the festival take care everyone see you soon